Welcome to another procedural text string tutorial. In this one, we are going to be generating a no group that can output a polygon with any number of sides. You can be able to change the size, the line thickness, and the fall off as well as rotation between one point and the next. That covers all of the different rotation positions that the shape could be in. The no group also outputs a solid version. This no group is a little bit simpler than what we did last week, but I just wanted to touch on things like the trigonometry that we looked at in episode three. And this is also just a good way for us to have a look at dot products and what we can do with those. So hope you enjoy it. Let's get stuck in. We are working with Blender 2.82. Hop into your preferences and make sure that the node wrangler is enabled. I'm just be working with my procedural texturing workspace as normal where I have my node space and a 3d viewport. In episode one we made this node that generates circles, squares, triangles and hearts and then in episode three we generated a node group that would allow us to have some kind of radial array. So we want to take some of this idea of the radial array and apply it to make a variable shape generator. So where do we begin? Well, we want to be able to define our regions. So to do that, we're going to take our object coordinates and we're going to add a gradient texture and set it to radial. So this gives us our zero to one. We then take a converter math set to multiply and this is going to give us our scale. So I can put this to 10, for example, and that is going to give us a zero to 10. Now we can duplicate this again, set it from multiply to snap and snap at one. So now every time it gets to the next factor of one, it will increase by a value of one. So now we have a list of values here that go from zero to one, two, three, and so on until you get to nine. So we have 10 indexes, but obviously starting at zero. And that is this number here in the multiply. Now we need to find a way to create a straight line in each of these so that we can create our shape. And the way that we're going to be doing that is we're going to generate a vector towards the center of each of these. And then we're going to use the dot product to draw a line perpendicular to that vector. Let's have a little look at what dot product actually does. I'm just adding a vector math node, changing it to dot product. Now you can see that this has a gray output, a single line of information coming out of it. If I set both of these to one, you can see that we're getting a gradient from zero upwards in that direction. And the gradient of this arrow is one and one. This also works in negative values. So if we have minus one, one, then you can see that where we go minus one, one, that is our vector there. It also means that if we use, for example, a greater than, then we're able to draw a line perpendicular to our vector. The actual math behind dot product is like this, a dot b. Let's say you have a vector a, and a is gonna have x component, y component, and z component. And you've got b, which has the same. And then to get to our final dot product, we are just taking our x components. We've got our a, and we've got our b, and these are being multiplied together. And then we add y, a and b. So these two are being multiplied together. And then our z's are going to be multiplied together and that'll equal some value. Now in the case of using it on coordinates, we have gradients, right? So we have zero at the beginning and these fall out in different directions. So at zero, anything times zero is going to be zero. So that's why our output, regardless of our b vector, is going to equal zero at the middle. Because this is linear, dot product will just give you gradient that is aligned with the bottom vector. So that being said, for us to get our straight line, we need the vectors from zero in the direction of our line segment. So let's say that we're doing a hexagon. We're going to have six edges. Each one of these edges needs its own vector pointing to the middle of it. Let's go back to our snapping vectors here. Let's do a hexagon. We have six zones. We want to find the vector to the middle. I'm going to add an input value. So this to be six. I'm going to plug that into the bottom of here. So this is the number of sides that we have. We need to know the angle per sector. That is going to be two radians is a full circle divided by the number of sectors. I'm going to take a math node set to divide two multiplied by pi into the top one. I'm going to take our sector count and use the bottom one. So this is now giving us a value per sector, which we can then multiply by our snapped value. But if we do this, we're going to get zero in the first one. We don't want zero. We want half of the angle. So rather than it just being the snapped value, we need to add 0.5. So now we have the angle per sector multiplied by 0 0.5, 1.5 going to give us this one, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5 and 5.5. So now if I multiply this by our angle per sector, then this is giving us the angle to the center of each one. So now we need to turn this angle into a vector and we're going to use trigonometry for that. Let's look at our first sector. We have the angle to that middle line here, right? That is what this is producing, that angle. 
and we know that this is a right angle, and we need to find the x component and the y component. So this is the opposite, and this is the adjacent. So if we look at our trigonometry, we have SOCATOA. We're going to be working with a vector length 1. So we can say that this hypotenuse length is equal to 1. So the hypotenuse equals 1. If we use sine, and sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is 1, so just cancel that down to just being opposite, which is our y vector. And we can use cosine of theta in the same way, so we can have that equaling our adjacent, which in this case is equal to our x value. And this is going to make up our vector. We just need to take our multiply node here, set this to cosine, and plug that in. Now if I take a converter, combine x, y, z, this is going to let us build our vector. So cosine is x, and if I control shift D and then set this one to sign, plug that into the Y. Now this is giving us a vector for each of our sectors. Now we have our vectors, we're going to take our dot product. If we put vectors into the bottom of here with our object coordinates into the top, you see that everything goes black. And the reason for that is that this is a positive vector and this is a negative vector. So if we have a vector which is going in this direction and we put it through our dot product and it is going like this, we have zero here going upwards, we need it to be flipped. We need it to go in the negative direction so that we can see it in that sector. We're going to duplicate our vector math node change it to scale and drop it on there. So now we have our vectors. We're going to scale them to minus one and this is going to flip them. And then when we look at our dot product, you can see that we have a gradient going from zero outwards. And if we just click on our greater than, you can see that this is a hexagon. Now, if I go over here to my value, which is our sector count, if I increase this, you can see that it is changing the number of sides that our shape has. And you can set this to whatever you want. So fundamentally, this is how you can generate shapes. But let's say we wanted a little bit more control over it. Rather than using a greater than, I'm just going to use a color mix RGB set to color burn. Set the second color to black. This is going to give us some size control. Duplicate color dodge. Set the second color to white. And this is going to give us a fall off control. What if we wanted to just draw an outline? A function that we've used before is absolute. We can see with the absolute, when we have a gradient from some negative value to some positive value, absolute makes all values positive. So I've got gradients at the moment, they're all coming out of the middle. If I just take an absolute here and plug that into the dot product, you can see it's not going to change anything. And that is because we're already dealing with only positive numbers. If instead of it coming out of the middle, we take another math node set to subtract, then as we increase the amount that we're subtracting from it, then we're bringing out that zero value. What was 0 0.5 is now zero. So then if we take our color dodge and color burn and we duplicate them and put them here, then all of a sudden we can set the thickness of our line and the sharpness of the fall off. So let's make this into a group node really quick. I'm going to cut the output nodes, select everything and go control G. We're going to rename this polygon. As per usual, I'm going to be using the text coordinate node on the outsides. Shift right click over those noodles and you will get a reroute, which I can now just plug in to my group input and delete from the inside. I'm going to add to the outside. We then want a control for the number of sides. Again, shift right click so that we have a reroute and I'm just going to put that in. Rename it to sides. My minimum value is going to be three because if you go fewer than three, then you're no longer using a polygon. Now a default value was going to be six. I want to make my outputs for this node. Now I could just plug from the color dodge out, but then it's going to give us a yellow socket and we're only dealing with black and white information here. So I'm going to take our absolute node and plug that in and then I'm going to cut it. Now if I select this one and I click plus, then it's going to duplicate it. Now my color dodges can go to those values. Top one is solid. The bottom one is outline. Now if we have a look at these, we're going to get our solid shape and our outline shape. And this is going to be controlled by our side number. I want to only use whole numbers for the sides. So I'm going to take from the sides and I'm I'm going to take a math node and I'm going to set it to snap and it's going to snap at one. So now no matter what I put in here, it's just going to snap to the whole number. Now let's have a look at our size, line thickness and fall off controls. I'm just going to take our group input node. I'm going to bring it over here just to be more convenient. Take our transparent socket and I'm going to plug that into the color burn. This one I'm going to call size. Now if I change the size on the solid, we get the size changing. On the outline, we've got nothing. We can just connect from this size into the bottom of our subtract. Now our size is going to change the outline matches the size of the solid. Now we can take another one for our line thickness, transparent socket to this color burn, and you see that this now controls the thickness of the line. It gets really thick really quickly, so I don't think we actually need a 0 to 1 range for the line thickness. Take a math node, set to divide, and divide it by 2. Then we're just going to halve that line thickness input, so it's going to give us a much more manageable range. Finally, we can add our color dodge, and this we can rename to fall off. And then we can just plug that one into the 
bottom color dodge as well. So they both are controlled by the same fall off values. What if you were, for example, using a square, but you didn't want it to be diagonal like this. You wanted it to be square on, or maybe even a triangle. You wanted it to be oriented differently. Well, we could put a slider on to make it rotate 360 degrees. So you could have it at any angle, but actually you only need to rotate between one face and the next point of rotational symmetry. So if I take a mapping node and I rotate this until we get to the next point, it looks the same. It's 120 degrees. So one third of 360. But if we had a six sided shape, then you only need to go 60 degrees, one sixth of 360. And within that, you have all of the rotations. So rather than having the ability to spin our shape 360 degrees, we're just going to set up a way for us to rotate it between one face and the next. So it needs to be dependent on the number of sides. I'm going to add a vector mapping and I'm going to drop it on that noodle there. We only want to be rotating in the Z axis. So we're going to add a converter, combine X, Y, Z. And we're going to connect that to the rotation. Then what we need to do is we need to take a rotation of one sector. So two pi divided by six or five or three. We have number of sectors and two pi divided by it. So we already have this here. I'm just going to go shift A layout reroute. And I'm going to plug that in. We're actually going to be feeding this backwards. And you have to be very careful when you feed backwards in a node graph. Normally you go really strictly left to right. Just because of the arrangement of our nodes, it's going to look like we're going backwards, but we're not actually going back into the same branch, if that makes sense. If we take this and then we plug it into our Z and then we just need some multiplier to say how much of that rotation we want at the moment it's doing all of it. So if we want to have a slider, we can just add, for example, a color invert and then connect that up. So now we have a factor slider on the front of our node group and I'm going to rename it rotation. Then if I take a converter math node and I set it to multiply and connect that rotation to it and this rotation, you can see that's working perfectly. So there we go. I hope this one's useful. I think it's a really good way to illustrate how we can use things like dot product and also trigonometry. I know people get a little bit put off when we start using mathematical functions, but I think that once you get a little bit of a handle on them, they're not actually that bad. So we have a nice little node group here. Let's you generate an angon, control over the size, line thickness if you're using line, fall off if you need that, and also the rotation between one side and another. This is a bit of a step down from last week in terms of complexity, but I just really wanted to be explaining some of the nodes a little bit more and some of the theory I think comes through in this sort of node group. So there we go. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next one.